All right, so let's get cooking. Um, you should have received an email from me yesterday that had like a Zoom link uh, in it. Um, I don't think we have any students this semester who are over in Ann Arbor attending the class, but I'll still always uh, run the class on Zoom because uh, I also use Zoom to record the lectures and I upload them to YouTube. So there's a link on the uh, uh, site for our YouTube lectures. Um, I don't use Panopto because it rarely works. That's what officially is the university's blah, blah, blah thingy. Um, but the YouTube thing will always work. Um, you're all adults. If you have a place better to be than here, that's fine. I rarely will take attendance, but there's always a risk of a quiz. That's kind of just my mood. If I want to give a quiz or not, or if there's a high uh, uh, attendance policy that day, I might, you know, if many people aren't here, I might just give a quiz just out of retaliation or something. Um, but, you know, you're all adults. If you're sick um, or whatever, class will always be on Zoom, so you can do that. Um, you know, obviously I don't know whether you're actually sick or just saying you're sick. So I encourage you to come to class in person. Um, but if for whatever reason you aren't able to make it, it'll be on Zoom, it'll be on recording, um, yada, yada, yada. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Um, syllabus is already on the website, um, but here's the highlight, highlight reel. So 10% uh, of your grade will be made up of these things that I call Bible homework. Um, I used to give a, it's a Bible reading and then a response thing. I used to do this once per week, um, uh, where every single, by midnight Sunday, you had to have something submitted. That was fine, but a little bit difficult to manage. Now what I do is I do three larger um, uh, Bible homework assignments were, which are effectively reading and writing like a, like a response paper thingy. Um, and uh, so there's three, they're due by the end of the semester. I encourage you to kind of get into a habit of a weekly reading and then kind of journaling type thing during the semester. But, you know, whatever makes you happy by the uh, midnight on Friday of finals week, have all three turned in because it's 10% of your grade. Okay, I'll have those up sometime this week, probably, if you um, wanted to start working on them, you can. All right. Um, but generally, uh, assignments in the class, which will be majority will be programming assignments here kind of early on. Uh, there'll be a couple of papers you're going to write as we just start getting into computer programming, and we'll start talking about that today. Uh, but there are 50% of your grade. All right. Uh, and you will have lots of homework in here, and I'll explain why here in a few minutes. Um, but I do also typically grade assignments relatively easily. Um, that isn't to let you, well, here, I'll just give you the highlight reel here. Since the majority of the assignments are programming assignments, you're gonna find out pretty quickly, for at least for most of you, programming is, e is not easy. It's, it's a difficult thing, all right? Some of you will, uh, if you've had some background in it already, um, you know, you might have a leg up um, or you already have had a bad experience and, uh, um, we are concerned coming into this class. Uh, I've been uh, teaching for 22 years and I've been teaching uh, software development for 22 years. Uh, my background is in language theory, creating programming languages. I think I teach it pretty well. So hopefully you have a little bit better experience um, in here, but I like to think about computer programming as being kind of like a sport. So if any of you are athletes or have ever taken up a sport before in your life, you know, you can go out, I'm, I'm an avid golfer. So I can go out and I can uh, you know, teach somebody how to hit a pitching wedge or something like that. And they can academically understand what I just taught them. But until they've hit, hit 10,000 pitching wedges, they're gonna be topping the ball, missing the ball, slicing it, hooking it, all, the, all this other stuff. You know, even though they academically understood it day one, until they put in the reps, until they put in the practice, it's gonna be very difficult for you to do it on your own. Programming is kind of like that. So you have to put in the reps you know, it's not me just being mean, giving you a thousand programming assignments. It's I, at some point, if you're going to learn the skill, you're going to have to have put in the reps to do it. Now, having said that, computer programming is a pretty high paying thing. So, you know, it's a kind of a superpower and it's worth putting in those reps. An important concept here, though, is uh, computer programming is not computer science. It is the tool that the computer scientist use, uses to solve its problems. 
So kind of like a hammer to a carpenter or something, something like that. But you do need to master um, that tool, regardless of which of our concentrations you're in, computer programming will be part of your career path throughout. Some jobs will be almost all programming. Some jobs will have, you know, 15% of the job might have some aspect of computer programming in it, but it's a skill you're going to have to have. Um, every single person in the department, regardless of concentration, will take the first two programming classes. So this one and uh, the sequel, which is next semester 250. Um, I teach them all. So if you end up hating me, that's uh, tough cookies. But, um, you know, eh, everybody loves me. It's going to work out. Um, so in any case, uh, I give lots of assignments, um, but I give you uh, one interesting thing with computer programming is sometimes you might spend like five hours on an assignment and have like almost nothing to show for it. And you're like, look, I tried 5,000 different things. None of them worked. Here is a paper soaked with my own tears or something, <laughs> some, something like that. So I have you submit this thing called a self-assessment with every single one of your assignments, kind of telling me, you know, what, how long did you spend on this? What was your experience based on your effort? What do you think you deserve based on what you actually gave me? What do you uh, think you deserve? And then kind of show me, tell me where things went wrong so I can focus in on that area of the, uh, um, the assignment to try to give you some tips on maybe getting out of that next time. Uh, I do encourage you to work in study groups. So again, assignments are going to be difficult. I, you know, for, uh, if you live on campus, that's obviously the easiest way of doing it. But with Zoom, um, you know, anybody can be part of a study group, get together, work on the homework together, do it in groups. I don't care if you're all turning in the same assignment. I'm going to find out on the exams whether you learn stuff. All right. So, um, you know, I'm not going to sit there looking for who copied whose code things like that. Ultimately, I want you to learn the stuff and whatever way is going to be the best way for you to accomplish that. That's great. So if you have some, you know, sometimes we'll have, I can pick up some examples over the years. We have a guy who's a senior right now. And when he was in your shoes, he was probably on the weaker side of, um, you know, picking up programming initially. And he day one started a study group. He was the leader of the study group, even though he maybe was among the weaker links in the group. But he kind of kept the group going. They, they, uh, you know, worked on homework together, and he learned from some of the uh, stronger students in class. And now he's among our best programmers in the department. You know, doesn't matter where you are today. Put in the effort. Work with groups. I mean, some of you might just be independent workers, and that's fine. But having some of your uh, classmates working on the stuff with you, you're going to make similar mistakes where when I'm sitting up here, I do a lot of live programming in class, it might look pretty easy. When you just spend five hours on your homework assignment, I come and solve it in 45 seconds, you know, you're going to be a little ticked off. Um, but that's kind of the point is you can spend that time and eventually get to the point where the stuff that you found difficult yesterday is going to be easy by the end of the semester and you can roll that right through your entire four years in, a, uh, in the program. All right, so lots of homework assignments. But I try to make it so that it benefits your grade. I'm, I want to encourage you to put in the reps, kind of like showing up to basketball practice. You're training for the big game, the two exams, let's say, okay? Um, where I'm not going to, you know, you know, ding you for, you know, a bad performance in practice as long as you put in the effort. Make some sense? Uh, two exams, one during midterm-ish week, week eight, uh, one during final exams. Um, Again, I don't think one day of bad performance should cost you during the semester. So if you come in and you bomb the midterm, which happens, sometimes you, it's a wake up call. You either haven't been working hard enough on the assignments or it just hasn't clicked yet, whatever the reason is, you know, if you do better on the final exam than you did on the midterm, I'll replace whatever you got in the midterm with what you got on the final exam. All right, every opportunity to do well in the class all the way up until the last day. Make some sense? All right, so take advantage of that, put in the hard work, put in the reps, and I promise you it'll pay off throughout your computer science degree and also in your, uh, you know, your pocketbook uh, later on when you go and uh, get your jobs and make the big bucks. All right, uh, questions about grade breakdown and that stuff. And what you're looking at here is basically the same grading scale that you'll have in every single Litman class throughout your four years. If you have me for a class, probably involves a lot of programming, 
and it'll have this gravy stuff. Okie dokie. Here's that self-assessment thing. I already kind of mentioned it um, out loud. It's on the slides. I have a link to these slides up on uh, uh, Blackboard already. I also have a link to the, this slide. Yeah, I have a link to this slide set up on Blackboard already. Um, I also have a blank template thing on Blackboard that has uh, this self-assessment. So whenever you turn in an assignment, you'll also copy this stuff into the Dropbox for the assignment and fill it out. You know, you don't have to spend an hour filling it out. I don't need a dissertation, but give me an idea what your experience was like. Because sometimes if I have an entire class that this just didn't go well. That might uh, make me teach the next class a little different. If I thought I covered a subject okay and you know nobody really got it, then we might need to backtrack and spend some more time. Okay, I already know this stuff, so it doesn't do me any good if I just leave everybody in the dust. Make some sense? All right. Um, so this is the 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 breakdown of of the class in general. Doesn't really matter. We're going to hit the stuff the way we're going to hit the stuff. Um, we do have a, we use Slack in the department, so we have a uh, Slack group set up, so uh, uh, I encourage everyone to download the Slack app, you can get it on Mac, you can get it on PC, you can get it on iPhone, you can get it on Android. Um, we have all of our classes on here as uh, uh, public channels, you could also create private channels, a lot of students who do study groups, they create a private channel for their study group so they can ask each other questions, things like that. I also encourage you to uh, ask questions inside the CSC 200 um, channel on here. If you're working on your homework and something's zigging when it should be zagging, ask a question. Maybe I'll be the one answering it first, or maybe one of your classmates will help. Again, at the end of the uh, at the end of the day, I want you to learn the stuff. However, that needs to be accomplished is fine. I'm not looking for like oh so and so had the same code as somebody else. I'll find out on the exams if you've learned not if you've learned nothing. Okay, so to get to the Slack channel, <laughs> go to um, cuwcs.slack.com. And what you're going to do is you will, um, let's see, I think you need to. Don't sign in with one of these things. I think you'll create an account. I think I don't have to because I've already been on this thing. <laughs> There'll be a way to create an account on here. And when you create your account, use your cuw.edu email address. And that will let you in to our, uh, um, uh, our Slack channel. If you have a problem with that, send me an email. And if there's enough people who are having issues, I can create an invite link and I'll send it to everybody in the class. You can just click on it. And that should let you in. But in any case, that'll, as long as you use your cuw.edu, that'll let you into uh, um, our Slack channel. Uh, upper right. Oh, there you go. Yeah, see, I was, see, he's paying attention. I was testing him. That's why I had to slip it <laughs> for the day. <laughs> For the day, you can have an A for the day. Um, so create an account, make sure you use your cuw.edu and that'll automatically let you into the uh, the deal. And then once you get into uh, Slack, join the CSE 200 group, you probably won't see a bunch of, a big list of groups like this. I think you'll probably have to go to channels um, and maybe do the plus sign and say browse channels and find CSE 200. Um, but ultimately, you'll probably be put into the general channel by default. That's just where we post. Um, I know sometimes there's just jokes and stuff that get posted in there, whatever. There's a channel for internships and things like that. Um, so we have channels for lots of different things. And you could also send me private messages um, on there. So um, yeah, so Slack is, a, is probably our official way of communicating within the department. Every single computer science student is on the Slack. Is on Slack. All right. Uh, and then when I send an email out, um, although when I send it from Blackboard, you probably don't see it. Um, 
but here I'll give you my information. Future. So I'm Mike Lippman. I'm the chair of the department. Um, so you can call me Dr. Lippman, whatever, but I'm not formal. So call me whatever you want. Um, it is michael.lippman at cuw.edu. My cell phone number. Phone calls are about the worst way of getting a hold of me, but feel free to text me. Just tell me who you are when you first text me and what class you're in so I can answer your questions in context. All right, so email, texting, Slack are the three best ways of um, getting in touch with me. Uh, terms of office hours, um, I don't just sit in my office waiting for somebody to come and randomly show up. If you wanna meet with me, no problem. I have plenty of time for you. I'm happy to set up a, a time to meet with you or either in person or on Zoom. Uh, so shoot me an email or a text or whatever, and I'm happy to, uh, uh, to do that, but I don't post specific office hours, but I do commonly, I might be in my office um, sitting there so you can you know, do tr trial and error if you want, or you can just hit me on Slack and say, hey, are you in your office? Um, but again, I'm happy to meet with you even after, you know, I, it's common, I might have a Zoom meeting with a student at 10 p.m. at night. So I'm, I'm available. Uh, I'm just not going to sit there and twiddle my thumbs and see if somebody wanders by. Okay, that's Slack. All right, questions about any of the crap so far? All right. So um, one thing that I think is an important thing with computer programming. First of all, how many of you have had some computer programming in the past, either dabbled, self-taught, or had a high school class that taught you something or whatever. Okay, so a good number of people. I do assume that you've never had programming before. So if you're one of the people that didn't get their hand up, you're like, okay, am I at a disadvantage? You are not. I'm gonna assume you've never seen a line of code before. Again, that doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. I promise you programming will be difficult. Um, and I'll explain today why it's going to be difficult and I think it'll make some sense. Hopefully those of you who've had some bad experiences with programming will, um, um, hear what I'm going to say and that'll make some sense to you. Maybe you haven't heard that before, explained that way before. Okay. Um, computer programming is a skill set. The language that we use does not matter. All right. Historically in this class, we've used Python in our first programming class. Um, second class, we've used Java. Third class, we've used C++. Um, uh, in the department, you'll use C Sharp. Uh, you'll use a language <laughs> called Scheme, um, several different things. Uh, this semester, I'm actually changing the language that we're going to be using in this first class. And um, there's a good reason for it. We're going to be using C and C++ in this first class, which is actually a relatively old language and a less friendly language. Um, and the reason we're using it is... Um, a language like Python, how many of you have uh, dabbled with Python before? Just out of curiosity. Okay, some of you. Um, Python is a pretty modern language that has a lot of conveniences built into it. And what ends up happening is, is in a beginning programming class, um, it's already intimidating to get into computer programming. It's already, a, a, that's, that part's already a problem, okay? Um, but because Python lets you automate so much stuff, and because today's student is so quick to dive into Google for the answer, um, you know, let's say that I were working with strings and I want you to write something to reverse a string. Chances are when I'm giving you an assignment to drill, it's in the context of something we've covered in class. I probably want you, if I want you to reverse a string, I'm probably having you create a loop walk from the end of the string to the beginning of a string, build up a brand new string, that kind of stuff. Well, in a language like Python, one line of code, you can just reverse a string. Now, even though that wasn't my intent, if you didn't do this on your own initially to follow my intent and you just did a search, you know, basically you just do a search for answer my homework assignment, right? Reverse a string you'll get an answer that will work in Python. And the point is, is then this is why I do the uh, self-assessment and I grade the homework fairly easily. I don't care if you get the right answer on the homework assignment. I'm looking for that experience. I want you to have spent time working on it, 
not writing the loop right, wondering why you're getting some stupid error, that kind of stuff. That's where learning is actually occurring. So if you find the answer online and type it in like, oh, it works. Well, you didn't learn anything. You just got the answer right. All right. So I'm uh, a language like Python where there's nothing wrong with the language and you will be exposed to the language in our program. Several of the other classes do use Python because it has so many conveniences built into it. It ends up hiding some of the stuff that actually is quite important in a first programming class things that you need to see, even though they're scary. I'd rather you be scared now, get over that hump now, so that later on you have a stronger foundation, as opposed to being able to take shortcuts in here, even if you didn't intend to take the shortcuts, right? You might, hey, look, I'm lost. I have a homework assignment due tomorrow. I'm gonna Google this and I got the best answer that I could and I'm so lost, I didn't know this wasn't helpful, right? <laughs> Something like that, that's gonna happen. Um, so I'm purposely picking a language that doesn't have a lot of conveniences built into it. So you'll feel like you're a programmer and it'll be okay. Cause you're going to still make just as many errors as you would have made the other way. You just have less free get out of jail cards. Um, uh, that kind of thing. All right. So, but again, this isn't going to be a problem because of this first statement here that computer programming is a skill set. The language that we use does not matter. Once you come out of this class and we go into Java next semester, I'm going to teach you the Java programming language in like one or two classes. And then we're going to be right back to writing code as if you already knew Java. Because programming is not difficult once you understand that skill set. Learning a new language isn't difficult once you have that initial skill set. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, the rest of this is garbage. All right, so super important slide. You're going to see this slide in my class, uh, even as seniors. I taught our language theory class this morning, CSC 470, where we write a programming language. We saw this slide in that class. All right, how do human beings solve problems? This is what, because ultimately, what's a programming language? What do you think? Anybody want to try to give me a... Uh, uh, a definition of what you think a programming language is? Go ahead. <laughs> Problem solving tool? Okay. Anybody want to add to that? That's a correct enough answer. Okay, I like that one. Ultimately, it's for us to tell this thing what to do. That's it, right? If we're talking to other human beings, which we've been doing our entire life, we use a natural language. So in here, we're using English because that's the only language I speak. I know enough Spanish to like order at Taco Bell. All right. So uh, my wife won some kind of, I don't know, Spanish speaking award in high school and she can't even order at Taco Bell. Yeah, I guess if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, but in any case, when we're, we're, we're pretty used to dealing with humans. So we don't use natural languages. We don't view them as a problem. Anybody in here speak uh, uh, another language pretty fluently other than English? What language we got? Hmong. Okay. Um, so when you're talking to your friends in that language, you have the same mindset as you do when you're speaking to somebody in English because you're talking to a human. The words that are coming out of your mouth might sound differently and things like that. But because you're talking to a human being, you're problem solving. The way you might describe how do you get to... Uh, um, the place where you're meeting them or something like that. That process is the same because you're talking to a human being and you need to give them the level of detail that a human being requires. Human beings can fill in the gaps in between and, you know, like, oh, I'll go down three, four streets. It's like the second or third stoplight, hang a left. I think I'm the fourth house on the right, but it might be the fifth, something like that. Human beings can roll with that, right? Because we're, we're, we're smart critters, right? We can fill in the gaps there. Okay, computers aren't, okay, computers are extremely precise. So as much as we are all experts at talking to other human beings, most of us are novices at best talking to a computer. That's why programming is hard. The language isn't the difficult part. The syntax isn't the difficult part. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's some rules, but really programming languages themselves are far, far, far less complicated than learning a natural language like English or Spanish or French. 
um, anything like that. Those languages are, are complicated. Okay, programming languages are simple in comparison. But because we're having to wield that language to ultimately tell this computer what to do, and we're not as skilled at communicating with a computer, it's a difficult skill to master. Because we have to slow our brains down and articulate every little detail when we're talking to a computer. That's why programming is hard, because we're not used to doing that. Okay, so it's not that programming languages are innately hard to learn. It's talking to a computer is innately hard for human beings because we're so used to talking to other human beings, not used to talking to a computer. That's really the thing that we're trying to learn, really in all the programming classes, but specifically in this first uh, computer programming class where we're just getting started, have no experience in talking to computers and all that jazz. This guy's a hard guy to talk to because we have to spell everything out. All right. So that's going to be our difficulty. So programming languages in them in and of themselves are a tool for us to tell this thing what to do. That's our goal. All right. So the best baseline now something that programming languages do do for us, even though some of us won't necessarily believe that as we start struggling with learning computer programming is that languages were designed to make life at least a little bit easier for us, okay? What language does a uh, computer speak natively? Binary, zeros and ones, okay? Um, now, if you had to uh, talk to a computer in, with a little two button keyboard, just tapping out zeros and ones all day long, we would go insane, right? Okay, that's not our cup of tea. Human beings make too many, too many mistakes for that. We're going to learn the basics of that like if we had to, right? Because we need to understand that as computer scientists, how binary works and how our languages ultimately do turn into that binary. But we're actually expecting these power tools. Human beings like power tools, right? We want to we wanna be able to talk to our computer at this super high level, even though it seems cryptic and difficult to us. It's far, far, far easier than talking to this guy in binary zeros and ones, okay? So a programming language is a power tool, even if it seems cryptic to us at first, all right? So punchline here is that programming languages attempt to have facilities built into them that allows a human being to talk to a computer in a similar way to how we already solve problems. So that's what this slide's all about. It's trying to capture the generic concept of how do human beings solve problems we use our memory so we remember stuff right you know they 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 do this in movies and things like that when you know as, as kind of a, like a funny thing when people have like short-term memory loss and stuff like that but it's very debilitating if we didn't have our memory if you didn't know your name or you didn't know you know little bits of information these are things we rely on right okay the ability to remember stuff. That is a core trait of how human beings solve problems. Okay. So we need to have our memory. We ask a lot of questions and we do a lot of repetition. All right. So if we kind of break these down just a little bit. And again, human beings are so good at problem solving that a lot of times we're not even aware we're doing these things. So if I ask each of you what your name is, all of you would be able to come up with that, right? Okay, now really you, you hear like, what's your name? You just spit it out. My name's Mike, right? I didn't actually detect that I was searching, you know, ruffling through the files in my head, finding this little spot that says my name is and looking next to hot ah, Mike, okay? I didn't, I didn't actually notice that I was retrieving that piece of information, but I kind of know that I did, right? Somewhere inside my brain that's stored somehow. We don't have to understand how it's stored, but it's stored somehow in there. And when you asked me what my name was, I went and looked it up really, really, really quick and then just spit it out. We believe that that happened, even though I didn't really know it was happening, right? Okay. So we're going to have facilities in every single programming language for remembering things. It's a requirement. It's a requirement for how we solve problems in real life. It's going to be a requirement for how we tell a computer what to do. Similarly, 
How many of you, uh, when you were walking to class today, um, uh, bumped into any walls? You, you miss every person that was in your way, kind of zipped in, and you were probably texting while you were doing it, right? It wasn't even worth your time because walking is difficult, right? What if you had to teach somebody how to walk? Could you write out all the little details of how do you walk? What do you think? Somebody want to teach me how to walk? Give me the steps. How do I walk? It's not rhetorical. Somebody give me the bet. You okay? I'll get up. I'm up. That was hard enough as it was. Okay. I'm I'm, I'm up. What do you want me to do? Pick up a, a what? First of all, what's a foot? Okay. We'll 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 give you a baseline. We'll assume I know what my feet are, but you're already getting the point, right? Okay, so I got you. Know, we, all right, this guy. Oh, which muscle? Try all of them. Just, just hit every, Okay, we're kind of, yeah, so we're kind of getting the point, right? So, so walking generically is like, okay, you pick up a foot and you start falling forward, you catch yourself. And then you let the momentum follow through and you catch yourself. But even that is a high level. Human beings can kind of figure out through trial and error, right? Um, so if we were talking to a computer and a computer was as complex as the human body is with all of these different muscles that can have to fire in a certain order and all this stuff, it would be nearly impossible for us to fully describe to a computer how to walk, correct? And this is actually kind of where some of our modern research in computer science comes in with like machine learning where we're building models of what our, our current understanding of the human brain, we call it a neural network, and we are training it through trial and error to learn patterns of doing things that we lack the skill to fully describe to a computer with a programming language. So we can't tell the computer how to walk, but we can sort of kind of maybe teach it to walk through the pattern and it just figures it out. You know, the robot falls over enough times, it kind of figures out how to catch itself. And all of a sudden, this thing's walking pretty well, and we don't know how. You know, my first experience with, uh, with artificial intelligence was, um, I don't know, a couple minutes ago. Um, and uh, we wrote a neural network. And uh, um, remember back, in, it probably was like in second grade when you had the little the multiplication flashcards, remember that? You know, and I, I, the red ones were the hardest ones in, when I was in second grade. Uh, we had to make our own flashcards. You have to make your own flashcards now or do they sell them? Probably make them buy them at Walmart or something. But we wrote our own. We made our own flashcards and cut them out of construction paper. But so we created this neural network and we trained it with the one through fives multiplication table. And the network's just guessing. So when you create a neural network, you, you know, just imagine you got all these little neurons and they're connected together through these these things, but this is all programmed, okay? Whatever that means to us right now, okay? And we initially just assign some numerical values to those connections between the neurons for some random reason. Just, this is a 2.3 and this is a 0.67, you know, whatever. And then what we did is we fed in the input three times four and the neural network took a guess. It just did all the math all the way through here and came up with some sort of answer and made a guess at it. Chances are it got it wrong first, right? Because it wasn't doing it based on any sort of logic. So then we did the proverbial slap on the wrist, updated the weights a little bit somehow. The one of the algorithms called the back propagation algorithm. Doesn't matter, but you know, we kind of just tweaked it. A you know, little twist there, a little twist there. Maybe next time it'll get it a little bit closer to right. Something like that. Kept feeding it that data over and over and over again, thousands and thousands and thousands of times, making little tiny tweaks each time until it got them all right or a high percentage of them right. Not because it learned how to do multiplication, but because we beat it up enough times and balanced it each time that it was able to magically guess the right answer. Let's just say in this case, it was 100% of the time. Make sense? But then the magic was this. I fed it the six through tens table and it got them all right. Data it had never seen before because I trained it on the pattern of multiplication. 
something that I didn't necessarily teach it how to do, but for lack of a better phrase, I beat it into it, right? <laughs> and it learn the pattern of multiplication. Now, that doesn't mean we can apply that to every single example of every problem we might ever solve. These are things you'll talk about in the artificial intelligence classes and things like that. But that kind of gives us that concept of there are going to be some human type tasks, even something that we think is being not overly complex, like multiplication, where it might, but like math is built into most of our programming languages. So we don't need to train a neural network to do multiplication. We can just say yeah, four times three is, is the one. You, you get the answer, right? So, um, but we can see that human beings, our ability to tell a computer what to do precisely does have a limit. So even as I'm sitting here saying that we've had a whole lifetime of practice talking to other human beings, and now we're trying to build up a skill of telling a computer what to do, we're still going to have a limitation, right? There's going to be a point where we're trying to describe something so complex that we just, we don't have the capability of getting into that level of detail. You know, we're going to make mistakes. And then we have this new field, this artificial intelligence field that allows us to kind of pick up the slack there for some problems and it, it's like magic it was just fascinating it was like the, the coolest thing ever um uh, you know so those are some things we want to keep in mind when we're learning to program is the hard part the challenge is learning how to articulate solutions to this computer because we suck at it because we've been dealing with human beings our whole lives and even if we've been playing video games and things like that, a lot of our computer usage has been using something that somebody else has done. You know, maybe we're pretty skilled at Call of Duty or something like that, right? But if you if somebody said, "Well, how does that how is that game written?" Well, that seems like magic, right? You know, it was magically created um, somewhere else. All right, so one hundred percent of computer programming languages will have facilities for these three things. And I asked the question a few minutes ago of how many of you bumped into walls on your way to uh, class today? You know, sometimes we have one or two smart asses. Say, ah. you know, but usually you're here texting, you're bobbing and weaving, missing people, and you didn't hit one wall. How? How did you avoid all the walls? How did you avoid all the people? While walking, doing this task that you couldn't even teach me how to do. A incredibly difficult task that wasn't even worth our full attention that's how good at problem solving human beings are how did you avoid the walls go ahead you practiced okay so when you um so once you got balanced so as a little kid you started walking um the default mode was was slamming the walls uh, probably there's some probably truth to that actually <laughs> they, they hurt when you run into it they hurt when you run into them. So, yeah, so it's the trial and error, the neural network thing. Okay, you stop bumping into them with your head and you start bumping into them with your shoulder. That seems to be not as good. Okay. All right. So let's say we're, we're past the practice, but now is it, are we all still prone to bumping into things, stepping off a curb the wrong way? You know, we still miss things sometimes, right? Okay. But in general, we're scanning our environment, right? Now, as you were walking down the hall, paying attention to your text messages or whatever game you're playing on your cell phone or, or, or whatever, were you actively thinking about, you know, what's in my, what's in my peripheral vision? What am I going to hit? You're scanning the room, you know, almost thinking about like the, you know, the, the, the movies where, you know, like, have like the Terminator has the little red boxes over things. You need to avoid that. So, you know, then you're, you're pushing a little bit more in your left foot to change your trajectory just enough to miss the, uh, uh, the person that's coming at you from the other direction. We know all that's happening, right? It's a truth. All that is occurring. But are we, do we actually recognize that we're asking all those questions? Am I going to hit something? Am I going to hit something? I'm going to bump into this wall. I'm going to bump into that wall. Am I going to fall over? Am I going to fall forward? Am I going to fall to the left? Whatever. But we believe that we are asking all those questions. And it's so mundane to us. We're so practiced at this that we don't even think about it. It's not worth, it's not worth our conscious attention. Make sense? But we believe we're doing it. So as we solve problems, besides using our memory, we ask a lot of questions. 
because we're constantly updating our behaviors based on decision making. And at the core of decision making is asking questions, getting the answers, and responding based on what that answer was. Fair enough? All right. So then repetition. We do a lot of repetition. So uh, with the walking, once we figure out how to do with one leg, figure out how to do with the other leg, it's a rinse, rinse, lather, repeat thing, right? Keep doing it over and over and over again. We also think about repetition in terms of kind of common skills that we might have. So somewhere we talked about a little bit ago that we have this ability to look something up in our brain. You know, what's your name? What's your phone number? Uh, what's your address? Things like that. We, we have a, a common skill to retrieve pieces of information from our brain. And that's a skill that we repeat often, correct? Um, and so that's, that's something that's already in our head and we just kind of, we pass it some information. We also have some, some skills like adding numbers. You know, as long as the numbers don't get too big and scary, if somebody says four plus three, we can come up with the seven, right? So somewhere in our head, there's a little ability where I can toss in two pieces of information and spit out an answer that is based on the addition of those two pieces of information, okay. So these three core components, memory, asking questions, and repetition, make up the, gener the generic way that human beings solve problems. We can sit here and break it down more than that probably, but I think it's a fair enough way of, of talking about how human beings solve problems. 100% of programming languages, every single language you will ever run into, every programming language you will ever run into will have facilities for these three things. So if you already have a skill set in computer programming, and I sit down and say, here's a brand new language we're going to use today. Here's how you do memory. So this next slide is going to be this mapping. All right. So memory typically is done through variables. We have these things in programming languages called variables, which are name value pairs. My name is Mike. So some way of representing the thing that we're remembering and then the value that's associated with it name value pairs okay my age is 18 all right stuff like that so 100 percent of programming languages will have facilities for memory typically called variables they'll have facilities for asking questions this is through conditionals usually if statements switch statements things like that they'll have facilities for repetition <clears throat> these are loops and also functions procedures, subroutines, whatever you maybe have heard of them uh, before, which are reusable chunks of code like I just talked about a minute ago, like you have this facility in your head that if you toss two numbers at it, you can spit out the sum of them. So somewhere in your head, you might have this little ability called add numbers, and that's kind of like a function, all right? 100% of programming languages have facilities for these things. <clears throat> all right. How many of you ever worked with HTML? Okay, a couple of you. Um, so one interesting thing is a lot of times I'll ask, you know, um, you know, who's had some programming? I asked that a little bit ago. We had a lot of hands, right? And you know, I'll say, well, what what languages have you worked with? And a lot of times HTML is one of those languages that pops up. Okay. Now the thing is, there's nothing wrong with HTML, but based on our definition right here, it's not a programming language. HTML does not let you remember things. It doesn't let you ask questions. It doesn't let you do repetition. All right. Um, so those of you who have worked with HTML before, so HTML is kind of our, our tool for creating website stuff, right? All right. So when you wrote websites, uh, what did you use in conjunction with HTML? What other things did you use? Go ahead. CSS. CSS? Okay. What's CSS for? So making, and really it solves, I mean, you could do that within HTML itself. But CSS solves the problem of, I want all my pages to look the same, right? Because before, if you wrote a website that was 20 pages and you made each one have a purple background, let's just keep it simple like that, purple background. And then all of a sudden you decide, you know what? I want a green background. You would have to go and change those 20 pages. Whereas if you use uh, cascading style sheets, you just change all the pages use the style sheet, you just change it in one place in the style sheet. And now all the pages now have a green background. Okay, that's the problem CSS is solving. Okay, what else do we have with uh, HTML you might use? Pearl? It's a pretty old skill set in HTML you're working with there. 
All right. So possibly for so Perl and some other languages would be uh, server side back end back end languages. So forget about that for right now. No, no, it's fine. That's good. Now we get off topic all the time. You're, you're fine. This is you're just getting the tip of the iceberg here. Um, all right. So what else? What else with HTML? What other Java JavaScript? Tell me about JavaScript. What's the purpose of JavaScript? Ah, so you can make sure website do stuff, not just look pretty, but do stuff. Would you say that JavaScript allows us to remember things, ask questions, repetition? Because HTML can't do those things itself, it's often used in conjunction with JavaScript yeah. to give us those dynamic programming language abilities that we might want our pretty user interface to take advantage of. HTML is a what I call a data representation language that's built for creating user interfaces. And those interfaces, while they don't have to work with dynamic data, you know, you could just have a web page that just spits data out and this is it. You just here's my static web page and you know it's showing something about your baseball card collection or something like that. Okay. But a lot of the pages we go to, so for instance, you go to Amazon or or something like that you have to log in you put your username and password in there so there's there's some inputs right kind of like we talked about a few minutes ago like get two numbers thrown at you you can add them together and spit the answer back out so you give it a couple of inputs you hit a little button now those inputs go somewhere magically they're flying over the internet and somewhere somewhere else there's a back-end program uh probably not written in pearl anymore but but regardless you know, a back-end programming program somewhere that's checking your credentials and making sure you are who you say you are and bringing up your correct Amazon account and, and all that stuff. Isn't it also uh, uh, your password and stuff like that? It can through cookies yeah. or now most of the web browsers have some like secure yeah. way of storing your, your passwords, that kind of stuff. So those are the, those are kind of like extra tools over and above, um, you know, these core components, HTML, JavaScript, CSS is just kind of a, an upgrade to HTML to make things more convenient to keep them pretty, something like that. But really the, the core concept we're talking about here is HTML is how our application looks. JavaScript dictates how our application works, okay? JavaScript gives us the ability to remember things, ask questions, perform repetition, because HTML can't do it itself. In the, the uh, 250 class, the next class, we start off looking at just generic Java programming, but the second half, we actually write uh, use Java in the context of writing Android applications, where we use Android's you know, uh, uh, interface designer. So we drag buttons onto the screen and, and stuff like that. That's kind of the equivalent of HTML. In fact, many of you, maybe you, you start off writing simple HTML pages by hand, but if you're making websites all the time, you're probably gonna use some professional tool, Dreamweaver or something like that, that allows you to basically drag and drop your site. And then you go in and tweak the actual HTML to get it looking just right. But you get it 85% of the way there with that just drag and drop tool. So that's building your user interface for a web page. Uh, Android has something very similar for building the user interface for an Android application. If you're doing iPhone, uh, the, the, the development tool for that is called Xcode and they have a tool built into that called Interface Builder, which allows you to build your interfaces. Very, Apple has very interesting naming conventions, right? Interface Builder for building interfaces. Yeah, they keep things simple. What's this? <laughs> so in any case, um, you know, these things, what time are we out of here, by the way? 35, 50, 12, 50? Okay. I think it's gotta be an hour and 15 minutes. Whatever, somebody tell me to shut up when it's over. Uh, Cause I just keep going. All right. It's actually happened. We have uh, grad classes we used to teach in the evenings. Now they're during the day, but uh, um, they're four hour classes once a week because it's for like working professionals. And, um, you know, a lot of times I get into my, onto a roll or whatever. I'm not really uh, focusing on time. I went over an hour over. 
And a lot of these students are, uh, they're international students and they're too polite to say anything. So they just let me keep cooking. <laughs> and we legitimately went over an hour, over. I was so excited, it was fun. All right. <laughs> All right, so do we kind of see how these programming languages fit into our world here? Okay, and this isn't to say that something like HTML is a, it's a necessary tool because as human beings, when we think about computer programs, a lot of times we're really thinking about them in terms of the user interface, right? We can respect, I used the example of Call of Duty earlier, pick your favorite video game, whatever it is. But really when you're thinking about a game like that, you expect that it just works behind the scenes. But what you really are judging it on is how does it look? Are the controls mapped correctly? Do they make sense? Things like that. You're judging it on its interface. You have the expectation that it just works. When there's a bug, oh, they're incompetent. I want my money back, yada, yada, yada. All these things. That's the programming side of it. Making the things work. Yeah, the back end. Okay. So talked about HTML, I call it data representation language, which is fine. It's a little tag based language. You got these little less than greater than signs around the different stuff. And it's a way of, uh, uh, of, of formatting your data so that the tool that knows how to interpret HTML, which is our web browsers, knows how to turn it into pretty pictures and text. That's what HTML is. It's a formatted language that web browsers know how to read and turn into pictures. All right, so we already talked about this. Why is programming hard? Because we're used to dealing with humans, not dealing with computers. That's the skill we're learning in here, is how do we slow our problem solving down to break it into those tiny little steps to tell this guy what to do? Understanding that the problems that we solve with computer programs, take Call of Duty as our example, I don't even play the game. I just keep using that as, my, as the example. Any first person shooter, I'm terrible at. It's just moving too fast. Yeah, I'm more of a World of Warcraft kind of kind of guy. Oh, well, that was just I, Doom in Doom days. I was pretty good at those. Oh, okay. Yeah, but as you get I'm older sorry, and older, myself, yeah, as you get older and older, things slow down. Yeah, and your eyesight gets worse, and and you get bored more easily. Yeah. I used to be able to sit in front of these games and just play for hours and hours and days, days. It was yeah. scary with World of Warcraft, days. Yeah. Now, like 45 minutes, I'm bored, yeah. okay? Except Hearthstone, I play Hearthstone like professionally. Yeah. I play in tournaments and stuff. That's because it's like intellectually stimulating and it's not based on speed. Um, I don't know, but if, if any of you want to get addicted to a video game that isn't a complete waste of like mindless waste of time, one of the strategy card games like Magic the Gathering, Hearthstone, something like that, has a lot of similarities with computer programming, the problem solving type stuff. I'm not encouraging you to get addicted to any video game, but if you have that tendency, maybe do a game that develops your problem solving, um, not so much your aggression, <laughs> things like that. What were you gonna say? Oh, you play Hearthstone? Okay. Oh, so you're, you, are you the one person who plays Hearthstone in eSports? Oh, three of you, okay. Do you have a favorite class? Like favorite, favorite class to play at Hearthstone? Oh, I hate shamans. I only play Face Hunter because I could just watch Netflix and play Face Hunter. Exactly, that's why I play it. <laughs> you're gonna watch movies while you're playing it. You got to make it mindless. <laughs> All right, we'll play Hearthstone sometime for your for your grade in the class. Now, Hearthstone is one of those games that you doesn't matter how skilled you are, you could lose to anybody. It's just because there's a lot of randomness in it. All right, um, so we've talked about why programming is hard. Makes sense to everybody. Okay, so any of you have historically had bad experiences with programming, understand that this is the core reason why. You are all really, really, really good problem solvers, but you're used to dealing with humans, not used to dealing with zeros and ones. 
not used to dealing with the discrete nature of something like this. And I promise you that act of just walking, the thing that you couldn't even pay full attention to on your way to class today while you were texting is so much more complex. That problem to solve is so much more complex than the hardest, most complex looking video game you can imagine. That's trivial. Writing the, writing the code for that video game is trivial compared to this problem that you've learned how to solve that isn't even worth your full attention anymore. So you already know you have the skills to do it from a problem solving perspective. You just haven't learned how to communicate with this alien here. Make some sense? All right. So keep that in mind when you start getting frustrated with programming is it's not C that you're afraid of. It's not Java, Python, pick, your, pick the programming language you're using. It's getting yourself to the point that you can break the problem down into the little tiny steps to tell this dude what to do. All right. All right, we kind of talked about this. I already talked about that. Kind of talked about that. Okay, so let's think about uh, um, this concept of an algorithm. Um, fancy schmancy name for basically it's a recipe. You know, if you're teaching somebody how to cook, you know, even if you consider yourself to be a bad cook, you can. You know, you can follow some basic directions, right? Even if it's the you know side of the hot pocket, just has like the three steps: take out of box, okay, uh, put in little crisp sleeve things, stick in microwave for three minutes, done. Don't eat until it's stopped boiling. You know that that kind of that 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 kind of thing. So all of us are capable of following some level of even if we don't feel we have a skill in cooking, we can follow some short, relatively short algorithm that gives us the step-by-step -step process of preparing something, right? Now, those of us who have the real skill in cooking, we can, we can follow the more complex algorithms where you're, you're chopping stuff up and dicing and slicing and, and all this stuff and preheating and you're making a sauce and a protein and all these other things all at the same time. Um, those are more complex algorithms, recipes we're solving, but they're still doing the same thing, right? But we have to solve them very, we have to follow them very explicitly. That's getting closer and closer to programming. So making a lasagna, isn't the order in which we do things very important? Like you can't cook it before you put all the stuff in the, the pan. You can't, it's like, ah, well, I preheated it already. It's already warm, I might as well stick it in there. And you know, as I, I'm, in, then I got to go to the grocery store because I mean, who keeps ricotta cheese on hand, right? You know, so you got to go to the grocery store, come back. The thing's been cooking for three hours now; it's just on fire. Let's just toss that in there. We'll probably have an inedible pile of goo. Yeah, pile of goo when you're done. Okay, so the order of operations was very important, right? We had to do this, then this, then this, then this, and then final preparation involved putting it in the oven. All right, that makes sense. Algorithms, the way we program is kind of like a recipe for making food, where even though we're talking to a human being, the details of it are very, very, very important. Now we maybe make some assumptions, right? With a human being, maybe we make the assumption that they know what a lasagna noodle is so that they, when they were at the, the grocery store, they were able to pick the right box off the shelf something like that. Maybe we assume that they know how to chop an onion ish, right? So maybe that algorithm doesn't go into that level of detail for chopping the onion, but it does say chop a half a cup of onions, throw into thing, right? So those recipes do have some nuances, which make the assumption that we are dealing with human beings and a human being will fill in some of those gaps. But a recipe is still pretty detailed. Right, it gives you those 15, 20 steps that really need to be followed in a pretty specific order in order to accomplish the task at hand. Computer programming really takes that to the next level where we can't necessarily just make the assumption for those steps in the middle. The fact that the computer already knows how to chop onions, 
we might have to go and write another algorithm for chopping onions. Here's the onion chopping instructions, you know, uh, something, something like that. What you could find is you know, modernly, what do we do? We watch a YouTube video, yeah. chop onions, YouTube it, and you know, we, we become idiots, you know, as a society. And, and, and that's kind of the, the uh, how teaching computer programming today is even more complex because problem solving among young people today has become so easy that you aren't relying on your own problem solving skills as much as historically you would have had to before the internet. Now, some people would look at that and say, well, our, our young people today are, you know, they're, 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 they're not as good at solving problems. Really, you're better at using the tools around you. Who wouldn't use Google? It knows everything. When I was a kid, I had to ride my bike to the library. That's true. Yeah, you had to, you had to pull it out. You had to, do, you know your, do you know your Dewey Decimal System? <laughs> Anymore, people probably visit the library as like a tourist. Yeah. It's like, this is where knowledge used to live. <laughs> What's a book? <laughs> you guys say, I, I, I don't keep physical books anymore. I might get a rash. I can go now. How old are you? 40. All right, I still got a few minutes on it. Yeah. <laughs> we can, we can, uh, we're, we're, we're in the right ballpark. Yeah. <laughs> we're in the right ballpark. The, the, the manual dial phones. <laughs> we had to build up the callus. Right? <laughs> and the side is you, you hit the stop. And, and Smith Sloan and Hyper. <laughs> <laughs> I had a school, I had a class in high school on a manual yeah. typewriter where the keys would get stuck together when they hit I, at the same I time. I had the, uh, the typing uh, on a 46 computer. Oh, yeah, computers. Yep. Young people. On a 46. <laughs> 46. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, stay tuned. We get we, we have an interesting slide that talks about uh, actually 46 computers specifically. Oh, wow. All right. So we're good on the algorithms. We can we can connect that to our idea of a recipe and we can put that to the next level where we think about, you know what? Yeah, if I'm trying to if if my grandma is giving me a recipe that I have to follow. Um, and I'm actually a pretty decent cook, but being a being a big guy and, and I eat a lot, I'm very impatient. <laughs> yeah, I don't wanna wait for it to be done. So I typically will go out or I make reservations. It's just more convenient for uh, the, the hangry uh, side of things. But we can certainly make that jump and say, well, if we're having to provide that recipe to a computer, we even need to be more detailed. Okay, that's our that's our mental space we should be in right now and in going from our modern problem solving thing where we're dealing with humans all the way to ultimately telling this dude what to do with the understanding that the problems we're asking our computer to do are significantly less complex than the problems we expect human beings to do even though many of you in your head when you think about a video game like a call of duty or something like that you think of those as being really, really, really complex and almost impossible to write, when really that's a trivial task compared to something that we view as simple like walking. Make sense? All right, so kind of just put this stuff in the right order in your head to realize the problem we're really trying to solve here, it isn't that hard of a problem. It's just something that we don't already have a pre-existing skill in solving because we're not used to talking to computers on their own terms. In fact, we're still mostly unwilling to talk to computers on their own terms. We still rely on our programming languages to kind of meet us about 85% of the way. So we really only need to learn that 15%. And then the programming language and the tools behind it will ultimately turn what we did into zeros and ones. Make some sense? All right, so uh, next bunch of slides are kind of interesting ones because what we they many of them say the same thing, but from different angles. So we're going to talk about kind of the different types of programming languages uh, that are out there. So uh, because whenever you learn a new language, even though I've kind of advertised that we think about languages in terms of, um, you know, how do you create variables? How do you write conditionals? How do you write loops and functions? If you can learn how to do those things in a language that was just put in front of you this morning, if you already know how to program, 
you can already solve a large percentage of problems with that brand new language, even though you're working with it for the first time. It does help to kind of be able to pigeonhole a language into the category um, that it might fall into among all programming languages, because that might give you a little bit of clue as to how that language might behave in certain situations, something along those lines. Um, all right. Choosing the right language for the job, blah, blah, blah. All right. So when we classify programming languages, we're thinking about them in terms of these things. Is it a high level language? Is it a low level language? Is it machine language? And we'll talk about each of these in passing. We're just looking at the high level here. We already referenced machine languages, right? Zeros and ones. So we'll talk about high level versus low level, um, well, probably next class, but soon. Uh, is it a compiled language or is it an interpreted language? What's the difference between those? What, what does it imply for us? Loosely typed versus strongly typed language. Again, one is not necessarily better or worse than the other, but it does imply for us how that language might behave under certain circumstances. And through our experiences, we might decide, oh, this problem I'm trying to solve, I want to make sure I'm using the right tool for the job. And because of the nature of this problem, as you get more and more experience, you might say, I want to use a language that is strongly typed and compiled to solve this problem for reason X, Y, and Z. All right, that might be a reasonable thing for you to come up with, even though you might be able to technically solve the problem with a different kind of language. You kind of want to use the right tool for the job, right? But we still, we solve all problems in our life in terms of the tools that are in our toolbox. Okay, but you know, you got the whole, uh, you know, the MacGyver thing where you can solve anything with a screwdriver and duct tape, right? Um, but ideally you have the correct tools around the house to solve some problem where you use the correct tools and try instead of, you know, Jerry, I fi I've fixed door jam things with tissue before. And sold the house with that still, and there was a struck. That was that was that <laughs> was, was a load bearing. <laughs> it was actually a conversation my wife and I had when we were uh, uh, we had a flood in our basement several years back, and as we were getting everything cleaned up, we uh, were back by where our furnace is down there, and I, I had fixed something with a beach towel. <laughs> I don't know what, but it was around like beams and stuff. She asked the question and wasn't joking. Is that load bearing? Was this beach towel a load bearing portion of our house? And the funny thing was it it, it was not not for anything above that level, but it was holding some stuff up. I was using the compression technique. Yeah. <laughs> all right um so loosely typed versus strongly typed and we'll talk about each of these as we go through uh general purpose versus domain specific a majority of the languages that you're going to deal with in your career are going to be general purpose languages so there are some programming languages that exist solely to solve a very 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 specific kind of problem those would be domain specific languages and frankly they're usually built on top of a general purpose language. All right, but 99% of the time as computer scientists, you're going to be using a general purpose language. So a programming language built for solving any kind of problem you can solve with a computer programming language. And then object oriented versus procedural. One's not necessarily better than another, but our object oriented languages are a more modern language. They've, they've taken a step closer to trying to allow a human being to solve problems like we already think about problems in our real life. All right, so um, in order to talk about a computer, I think we're getting into the C++, right? Or the CPU, yeah. So ultimately, when we're telling a computer what to do, we're talking to the processor in this computer, the CPU. What is a CPU? Go ahead. Okay, so you know we call it it's a central processing unit it's it's the brain of the computer it effectively anything you tell the computer to do has to go through that guy. 
But what is the nature of the CPU? Like what's inside of that chip? What, what does it look like? What If you were to kind of give a generic concept of what a CPU is, what might you say? It has thousands and billions of transistors. Okay, what's a transistor? Uh, one is one zero, you know, well, they're, they're NP, uh, NP, uh, ENPs or NP. Uh, yeah, so you're getting to the technical side of it. What's a transistor? Transistor is a, uh, a switch, basically. It's a switch. We can say that. Okay, so a transistor is a, is a computer program built out of hardware. Okay, so effectively, it's a computer program that either outputs electricity or doesn't output electricity. It's a switch, on or off, zero or one. Okay, and based on the, the hoops that the electricity had to jump through on the way to that transistor, different things might actually occur. All sorts of stuff. So when we talk about our processors, what are our processors actually? They are a collection. I, I usually think of them like a collection of magic tricks, okay? Where each of these magic tricks is a computer program, but it's made out of hardware. Transistors, um, gates, AND gates, OR gates, NOR gates, ZOR gates, all sorts of different uh, Boolean types of gates. These are the things that make up the solutions to all of our computer problems. But the way a um, CPU works, and we'll just in our last minute here, we'll just give a high level thing. If we think of the human body kind of like a CPU, and I'm gonna pick up my coffee mug here, there is a series. I mean, if I go like this with my hand, and I move my thumb. Nobody's overly impressed by that. Pretty much all of us in here can move our thumb that way. Right, and you can also do that with your hand, right? But if I wanna pick up this mug, it's a series of movements using my elbow, things like that, ultimately gripping with my hand, moving my thumb. So there are a series of little movements like this, movements like this, movements like this that I've strung together in a very specific order to ultimately pick up this coffee mug. That's what a CPU is. It's a collection of things like this, things like this that when we call upon those little tiny little solutions that aren't impressive in and of themselves in the right order and in the right quantity actual problems get solved all right so we'll pick up here on uh thursday uh, i will upload the video to youtube if you want to go and watch it again it's a great way to put yourself to sleep at night um i will see everybody on thursday There will be assignments, but nothing for Thursday. So no assignment yet. Uh, if you want, if you're going to do anything, maybe get yourself on Slack. Make sure you're on the Slack channel.